Unit 5. Long run consequences of stabilization. Wow. We've suddenly become relevant. Okay, so I'm good now. Ah, it's like day five. We're crushing this thing. Unit five, long run consequences of stabilization. Super quirky, kind of interesting. Oh, personal note. I realize there are like a zillion videos on the internet which probably do a better job with better technology. Certainly better video recording equipment. No offense, computer, you're doing a great job. However, I feel as if we have a personal responsibility to share this time and attempt to embrace the challenge. You know, sink or swim, we're going to do our best to swim. Unit 5 is about stabilizing a crashing and burning economy. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, anyway, it's not a lot of content, so buckle in. Let's run through this thing. You have two options here to fix the economy, fiscal or monetary policy. In both scenarios, the goal would actually be to do expansionary policy, because if you're in a recession, you have to expand the economy. Surprise! Uh, expansionary fiscal policy would be more spending and less taxation, because more spending would raise GDP. Government spending is, you know, the G in the expenditure equation. And then lowering people's taxes allows them to consume and invest more, and that would raise GDP as well. Expansionary monetary policy would be buying bonds in the open market operations, lowering the discount rate and thus the federal funds rate, and lowering the reserve requirement. To be totally honest, the goal here is lower nominal interest rates, shift the money supply line right on the money market graph, and these three things would accomplish that. Um, by the way, by indirectly buying bonds, we are lowering the federal funds rate, so the Fed can manipulate the interest rates that banks charge each other also through open market operations, which is pretty sweet. Something to watch out for over here, um, obviously to contract the economy if we were overheating, we would sell bonds, raise discount rate, raise reserve ratio. And the, the challenge here is, and the reason why we would do both fiscal and monetary, is because it's very likely that on the fiscal side, we'd have to crowd out the lending market on the loanable funds market. And that's happening today, as we see Congress about to pass this, this package, this stimulus package that's probably in excess of $1.3 trillion, possibly with direct payments to Americans. And that's almost certainly going to increase the government deficit. This, very interestingly, is not something we should worry about because the stimulus package is very important. But it's, oh, I just kind of burped a little bit in case you wanted an update. But it is super important because we would raise interest rates if we do this too much by crowding out. So the Fed's goal is to lower interest rates simultaneously or at least remove inflation from them uh, through this process of increasing the money supply. Over here is the LRAS graph, the majestic mothership. And watch out, there's not a lot of new information I'm going to go over today. Just something to be kind of aware of. Remember that it's inexplicably... Oh, there's a bell. Do you feel like you miss home, perhaps? Oh, no. You probably are home constantly. This home. Because this is, I guess, where I live now. Uh, the LRAS graph is inexplicably, no, it's very explainable, uh, directly linked to the Phillips curve. So if something happens over here, you can draw it over here on the Phillips curve. And there's really only one rule to remember. If demand shifts, you move the dot on the Phillips curve. This is a recession. That's an inflationary gap. If supply shifts, you have to shift the entire short-run Phillips curve. So, for example, if we have a positive supply shock, prices go down to the short-run Phillips curve, which shifts to the left. Nothing too wild there, um, you know, and that's really the only thing that's going to happen. One thing to watch out for is if the entire LRAS line moves, you have a major infrastructural change or human capital change, uh, free college to the United States, thus causing both demand and supply to shift right, permanent growth. You would see the Phillips curve, long run Phillips curve, shift left in that scenario because if the long run aggregate supply line moves, so too does the long run Phillips curve but they're opposite. It would go the opposite direction. Kind of the last thing to go over is this quantity theory of money, which is this idea that if you take the money supply times the velocity, that's how fast a dollar changes hands, it will be equal to the price level times real GDP. These two things combined are just nominal GDP, and on the AP exam, they'll likely you know give you three out of four of these, and you'll have to figure out what the fourth thing is. Nothing too challenging there. Um, you know. Cool. So, questions for the good of the order? I thought I'd do that out of good form. Hope you guys are doing great and wonderful spring break to everybody, except not with others, just kind of like in your basement playing board games with yourself. Bye bye.